it. Okay, well, it's five minutes past the hour and uh, everybody's got their daytime job to do, so uh, we better crack on. <clears throat> so uh, I'm John Cleland. I'm director of the Robertson Center for Biostatistics and Clinical Trials, but I'm really a cardiologist and my career has been uh, in uh, heart failure. Um, and uh, I don't really understand heart failure, which I guess is a good position to be in, because if you don't really understand the problem, you start asking questions, and uh, some of those questions can be quite uh, simple, uh, but then very difficult to answer. So um, I see heart failure as uh, common, uh, deadly, and neglected. Uh, we are, uh, have a lot of work to do on this uh, topic. And now I'm going to try and advance my slides, uh, which were advancing well before. This is the, today's agenda. Uh, Jocelyn Friday, who has just spoken, is uh, going to talk about uh, uh, analysis of the Glasgow Safe Haven data, which I think is revealing some very interesting results. Pierre Paolo is going to talk a little bit on the cardiac imaging side and uh, getting its democratizing it, shall we say, and then a little word about uh, why we need to redefine exactly what heart failure is if we're going to make progress in this field. So this is one of the latest uh, publications, the, uh, the universal definition of heart failure. Uh, I think this was a massive stride backwards. Uh, it looks just like the uh, the old definition of uh, heart failure from 30 years ago. Uh, just it's a little bit more colourful. More important uh, shortly. And here's one of the great uh, philosophers in medicine. I use him a lot in my lectures for teaching. Uh, I'm sure that you know the this famous quote from Donald Rumsfeld. So what do we think we know about heart failure? Well, we think we know that the lifetime risk is about one in five. So that means a couple of people on this uh, talk are going to get it. Uh, what people don't really appreciate is the, the incidence of heart failure is about the same as for type two diabetes in the UK. So people think of diabetes as common and heart failure is much rarer. That's not true. The incidence of these two conditions is pretty well the same. The reason why the prevalence of heart failure is a lot lower than for type 2 diabetes is you just don't live very long with heart failure. Of course, it has a heavy burden of symptoms, uh, something that's not appreciated by most uh, physicians. Is that most cardiovascular deaths are preceded by heart failure. If you have an infarct and you don't develop heart failure, you're going to do quite well. And it's only once the heart starts to fail that then the risk from things like myocardial infarction and atrial fibrillation, etc., rise. Uh, but most patients who get heart failure will die before their symptoms and signs become resistant to therapy. So in a sense, patients die with heart failure. Uh, they'll often die suddenly, either of an arrhythmia or another vascular event. Or, for instance, uh, if you get a respiratory infection, you're much more likely to die from it if you have pre-existing heart failure than if you don't. If we take it down to a UK level, there's about 200,000 new cases per year, and therefore to keep things in epidemiological balance, around about 200,000 deaths. There's about half a million uh, hospitalizations in the NHS each year where it's a primary or contributory cause. The average bed day stay is 10 days, so that's 5 million NHS bed days. Um, these estimates are very old about the cost, but perhaps 2 billion per year. Uh, since this is an Institute of Health and Wellbeing lecture, we have to talk about uh, gender equality and uh, social deprivation. Well, if you are, um, yeah, have uh, if you're less affluent, you're likely to get your heart failure at a younger age, and there may be up to a decade uh, younger. But because wealthier people live longer, uh, the actual lifetime risk is pretty well similar, whether you're in social class one or social class five. So it's, a, it's um, uh, strongly linked to age. 
in terms of women, uh, the uh, later onset of heart failure again, but same lifetime risk. Uh, in the year after uh, a diagnosis of heart failure, uh, if you're below the age of 80, then it's about a 20% of mortality. If you're above the age of 80, it's about 40%. But Donald Rumsfeld forgot to say one thing, uh, or many things, I guess, but so he might have added, there are things that we know, but they just aren't true. And uh, it's a problem. And uh, of course, Lord Kelvin, uh, who um, lived very close to here, said, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And can we actually really measure what's going on with heart failure? Uh, some of us call this the joke atlas of uh, heart failure published by the European Society. Uh, look at the prevalence of uh, heart failure in Germany three times what it is in the UK. Is that really possibly true? It might be true that the, uh, the Greeks uh, down here in the corner um, have uh, uh, a lower risk, but yeah, these uh, data don't make much sense. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jocelyn, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about heart failure in Glasgow and whether we miss the diagnosis more often than we make it. Okay. Thank you. And do we see PowerPoint slide? Hopefully. Yes, yes, we do. Lovely. Right. Uh, feel free to interrupt at any point to ask questions. My name is Jocelyn Friday. I am a final year PhD candidate uh, with the Robertson Center for Biostatistics. I'm going to be looking into uh, heart failure in Glasgow. Is the diagnosis usually missed? So the rationale for this heart failure is a heterogeneous clinical syndrome and lacks a gold standard test for defining its presence or absence. It's currently defined by nonspecific signs and symptoms, which are often attributed to aging and are often missed until they are severe. Heart failure is also defined by evidence of cardiac dysfunction, which is not often investigated. It has multiple underlying etiological and physiological factors, regardless of etiology, uh, fluid retention, um, also known as congestion, is fundamental. For this reason, we focus on the use of loop diuretics, a major medical classification that is used primarily for the treatment of uh, edema, pulmonary edema or congestion, but can also be added to help individuals with treatment-resistant hypertension or in those with impaired renal function. To this end, we use the heterogeneous anonymized linked data set from the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board Safe Haven. We defined heart failure using read and ICD-10 codes selected based on previously published research and expert opinion. The diagnosis date was taken as the first record in any diagnostic position. We then, to focus on individuals with a repeat prescription of loop diuretics rather than those who had, so to focus on individuals where the loop diuretic usage was for long-term treatment and not a one-off prescription, we just um, defined a repeat prescription as individuals who had medication dispensed over two consecutive quarters or died within 90 days of the first prescription. To understand, we analyze prevalent cases to understand the chronic population, and we characterize patients based on their status on the 31st of December 2011. Out of our, this research was carried out on a data set of individuals with a record of heart failure, coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease, or the treatment therein between the 1st of January 2010 through March 31st, 2018. We focused uh, on prevalent cases on the 31st of December 2011 with a total of just over 201,000 individuals who had either heart failure, repeat prescription of loop diuretic, or are classified as at risk of developing heart failure. 
So this is the split into cohort groups based on your loop diuretic and heart failure status. We also age stratified the at-risk group to allow for fair comparisons. If you'll notice, the loop diuretic only group is double the size of any of those with a heart failure diagnosis. If we then go down to age, it's a similar age stratification with the heart failure only group being slightly younger. If we go on to sex, the women loop diuretic only group are predominantly women, uh, heart failure only are predominantly men. Similar rates of hypertension across the board and the hypertension rates do not begin to describe this loop diuretic only population. If we go on further to ischemic heart disease, you see an increase, a uh, marked increase in the heart failure only group of those um, with the myocardial infarction, so heart attack. Uh, we compare, we can see a significant difference between the loop diuretic only group and the heart failure only group. Ah, and then finally, uh, well, similar rates of cancer overall. And if we define impaired renal function as the estimated globular, filtri globular filtration rate, excuse me, of less than 60, we see um, an increase in the loop diuretic and heart failure group, unsurprisingly, but the loop diuretic only group, again, these rates do not begin to describe the size of the loop diuretic only population. If we go on to left ventricular ejection fraction, these are results taken from the closest echo within a two year window to the 31st of December, 2011, in order to capture routine investigation rates. Hues darken with severity. On the graph on the right, you can see um, of those who take a loop diuretic, in the absence of heart failure, only a few have a reduced ventricular, left ventricular ejection fraction, shown in the blues and in the brackets. Go moving on, if we look at left atrial diameter, again, using that same echo, and in contrast to the previous slide, a large proportion of those in a loop diuretic regardless of heart failure status, have a dilated left atria with fuchsia being borderline dilation and the shades of purple indicating uh, left atrial dilation with colors darkening with severity. Going on to mortality, uh, we've, for, we have a couple Meyer graph here with the at-risk stratified by age. And on the right, we have a forest plot of a Weibull model with a combined at-risk group adjusting for age by decade, sex, and socioeconomic deprivation. Um, if we look at, compared to those at risk, we can see a 1.2-fold increase in mortality for the heart failure only group, yet the presence of a loop diuretic in the loop diuretic and loop diuretic and heart failure only group uh, drives the increase in mortality uh, for these groups. So clearly we have a high mortality rate among the loop diuretic population, which are largely women, and they don't look like your textbook heart failure cases, if there is such a thing. We then sought to describe incident heart failure and or loop diuretic usage, um, and the rate and pattern of hospital admissions in the year preceding um, an event in order to investigate potential triggers. So going on using that same data set, we investigated in this, in this case, incident cases, from January 31st, sorry, January 1st, 2012 through March 31st, 2017. And we end up with a population just shy of 29,000. This is a bit tricky, but we go with cohort groups. So we have six groups. On the right is an example of a both heart failure first individual. So we look for the first record of heart failure or repeat prescriptions of loop diuretic. In this case, we find heart failure first. And then we look within a year to see if we see a second event. In this case, we do, which is the loop diuretic diagnosis. So we say we classify this as a both, this individual as a both heart failure first. We use the heart failure diagnosis date to then look one year back to find your start date. This is what we use to define baseline characteristics and is the start um, to look for hospital admissions. Um, and changes in prescription status. Um, of the six groups, we have loop diuretic only, both loop diuretic first, both together. So this is when the two first and second key events occur within a 30 day window, both heart failure first, heart failure only, and our final little bit of an oddball is index. Those who were not on a loop diuretic um, and either did not survive their index heart failure hospitalization or received their diagnosis of heart failure in death, and they're separated because they were not 
given the opportunity to receive a loop diuretic prescription in community following um, guidelines. So again, if we look at baseline characteristics across the way, loop diuretic only is double the size of any of those with a heart failure diagnosis. Again, similar age ranges, but heart failure only is slightly lower. Again, we see a similar pattern with the loop diuretic only being predominantly women and heart failure only being predominantly men. If we look at comorbidity status, both loop diuretic first are slightly more comorbid uh, with a median of two comorbidities. Um, looking at hospitalization rates in the year prior to an event, we see similar rates across the board with unsurprisingly a slight in uh, increase in those who did not survive that hospitalization. Of those that were hospitalized, if we look at the median, the number of hospitalizations, um, the heart failure only are slightly different in that they have a median first and, th and third quartile of one admission. And if we look at admissions adjusted for patient years at risk, uh, again, similar across the board, loop diuretic, slightly loop diuretic first, slightly increased. Uh, and again, we see another increase with the index hospitalization of death. So these are directed graphs of admit hospital admissions lasting longer than one day in the year preceding an event. The edge thickness represents how the relative flow of individuals. Uh, the nodes are scaled based on the number of different entry and exit points. What I want you to pay attention to here in the loop diuretic only group is that there is no clear driving pathway and that compared to with the heart failure, when we add a heart failure diagnosis, we see that um, we get a more linear pathway and atrial fibrillation, ischemic heart disease, and acute myocardial infarction starts to drive the pattern. If we then go and look at the heart failure only population, this becomes more clear with the ischemic heart disease, acute myocardial infarction, and atrial fibrillation flutter, again, both loop diuretic first, a very clear single admission for acute myocardial infarction, both together, so these are following guidelines. Again, that clear single admission for acute myocardial infarction. And a little bit differently, the index hospitalization of death for a single admission for an injury. This tends to be um, fractures in the femur or infection, infections in uh, joint prosthetic joints. If we then go on to number of admissions, so of those, take the count up the number of admissions in those graphs we can see that the total number of, that the loop diuretic only population exerts a considerable amount of pressure on the NHS. Um, but once we adjust for person years at risk, um, unsurprisingly, the, those who died or did not survive their index failure hospitalizations start to adjust um, and exert the, pressure, exert the pressure on the NHS as well as the other heart failure groups. So these are changes in comor comorbidity levels, excuse me. Um, and you can see, for example, I take the loop diuretic only, very little change. And then if you compare them against the both together group and the both heart failure only group, you can see in the year prior, in that year leading up to diagnosis, the most change, and that's driven by your ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarction, atrial fibrillation, and chronic kidney disease, although the pattern exists elsewhere, um, it's very stark in contrast to loop diuretic only group. If we go on to changes in prescription, again, we see that same pattern. We see a prescribing inertia in the loop diuretic only group, very little change. Uh, and we see a big change primarily in your cardiovascular and heart failure medications, specifically um, seen strongest in the both together and the heart failure only groups. Although you can see it um, again in the loop diuretic and both heart failure first. Oops. So in conclusion, loop diuretic prescriptions outpace the diagnosis of heart failure to the point that only 20% of loop diuretic population receives a diagnosis of heart failure. And this impacts women more. We see that mortality is linked to the presence of the loop diuretic rather than the prognosis of heart failure. Um, in the loop diuretic prescription, we see a lack of cardiac investigations and where they're done, we see a large proportion, proportion, excuse me, have left atrial enlargement and a few have reduced vent left ventricular ejection fractions, uh, um, a finding that is often consistent with heart failure with preserved ejection fractions. Comorbidities, specifically the alternative reasons for a loop diuretic prescription fail to explain the use of the loop diuretic. Um, bottom line, we need further research 
into uh, this loop diuretic population as they clearly have poor outcomes even after we adjust for age, sex, and socioeconomic deprivation. Thank you. Very good. So um, has Neve got any questions or Caroline um, or anybody else? But uh, the others have, all have opportunities of speaking to you at other times. No questions particularly, but it's very interesting to see. Or I suppose just wondering what explains it. When you said it at first, I thought, oh, the, you're going to have lots of extra loop diuretics who were prescribed it 20 odd years ago for their swollen ankles, but that doesn't explain those changes that you've seen in the mortality and admission pathways and things. It's very interesting. Yep. And, and, and not the incident cases either. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not an old phenomenon. It's not historical. It's, it's still happening. Yeah. Prescription levels. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. No questions here. Just wanted to say well done, Jocelyn. That was a very interesting talk. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> so, Pierre Paolo, you've got uh, uh, an act to follow. I'll try to. Let me see. So, Pierre Paolo is uh, a clinical cardiologist uh, and uh, Glasgow's best uh, cardiac ultrasonographer possibly the best in Scotland, possibly the best in the world. <laughs> ah, that sounds quite huge. Anyway, uh, can you see the slides? Yep, we can even see something that's sort of moving. Yeah, it should move. I mean, both should really move, but they don't. But for those who are not cardiologists, I mean, these are two hearts of two different patients who came to the uh, coronary care with signs and symptoms of heart failure. So on the left, so can you see my arrow or a little hand? Yes, a little hand, yeah. For those who do not know what an ultrasound is. So this is the left ventricle, which is the chamber that pumps the blood into the aorta and then distributes blood to your organs and tissues. And in this case, it's not pumping very well. So the ejection fraction might be around 10%. If you look on the patient on the right, so this again, this is the left ventricle, pumps much better than that. It's not really normal, but it's not severely impaired. Let's say it's 45, 50%. But whatever the ejection fraction is, the outcome of this patient is likely to be equally poor and their mortality rate is around 20% after a year. So really the ejection fraction is not as great as other things to stratify the risk of these patients. So we need to identify better the consequences of cardiac dysfunction to better stratify prognosis in patients with heart failure. And as Jocelyn has mentioned, one of the jumpers, in this case, the left atrium that is behind or above or below the ventricle depends how you look at the heart and from where, but it's a thin wall chamber that really is sensitive to changes in intracardiac pressure. So when they increase the atrium distance and if the atrium distance and becomes dysfunctional, the prognosis is poor even for not just for patients with heart failure as you can see here on the right but also in the general population again suggesting that the dilated left atrium is an early marker of congestion and cardiac dysfunction what happens then that when the elevated filling pressure persists the problem extends even more distally or backwards let's say to the lungs and to the other side of the heart to the right side of the heart and even in patients who do not have signs and symptoms so they those who come and they feel very well they their legs are nice and dry you listen to the chest they look all right again up to 50 percent of these with heart failure they already have some signs of fluids into the lungs or into the venous system and the the concurrent presence of these signs identifies people with very high BNP and poor outcome. The inferior vena cava, again, this tube or this canal here that you see close to the liver, is basically a, a tube that brings the blood from the legs and to the bottom part of the body back to the heart. If the pressures inside the heart are elevated, it struggles to fill in the heart. So the only way to do it is to increase the pressure and to distend. So a distended inferior vena cava identifies people who, when they come to hospital with breathlessness, are more likely to have heart failure as likely diagnosed. If they are diagnosed with heart failure, we treat them with diuretics. If the IBC does not respond, it doesn't shrink during the uh, 
hospitalization phase, again, at discharge, this identifies those people who are more likely to come back to hospital very quickly or to incur into a premature death. For those who are discharged and then they keep coming to our clinic, again, the IVC diameter is probably one of the most powerful prognosticator we might have and we, to identify, again, those people at greater risk. It does as good as NT-proBNP, as you can see from this slide. And it has also some advantages because you can assess the IVC in real time. You can, and if you need to act and make some changes in the management of your patient, you can really do at the same time without waiting for any additional results. As in the case of NTP or BNP, that you need to take the blood, send to the lab, and then the results comes back after two hours, three hours, but the patient has already gone home by then. The problem with the IVC is that in 10, 15% of patients, due to their body habitus, we are unable to measure it. And this is why we decide to look at the other side. So rather than looking at what collects the blood from the bottom part, we look at the vein that collects the blood from the head and brings it down. So the internal jugular vein that we can easily measure with a probe, place the probe in the neck. And this is what we see. So here there are two extremes of the problem. On the left, a patient whose jugular vein is very tiny at rest. And then when we ask the patient to do a salva, basically a maneuver to increase the pressure into the abdomen, the vessel expands, so it distends by around seven, eight fold. This identifies a, a well-controlled situation. On the other side, so on the right, you have a patient whose antipro BNP is high, is congested, the jugular vein is already here, distended at baseline, and it, the diameter really doesn't change too much during the salva. This identifies a very dangerous situation. And if we don't make any change, I mean, the patient is likely to have a much poorer outcome in blue here, you can see the Kaplan-Meier, compared to those whose response is normal in green, who actually have, even if they have heart failure, an outcome similar to those not considered to have heart failure here in, in orange. To do this test is very easy, can be done in virtually in everyone. And you can train your colleagues very quickly and the variability between trained personnel is uh, minimal. And as we said before, these measurements do not reflect the uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, but they are more linked to a right side problem in the heart. With the ultrasound, we can also measure the fluids in the lungs. So in a normal situation, this is how a normal lung should look like basically dark on the screen, you should not be able to see anything. But when fluids start to accumulate, you might notice some artifacts or B lines, they are called, that come, uh, they emerge from the pleura and they move down to the screen. And the more fluids patients have, the more B lines you can see until this precedes then the lung collapse and development of pleural effusion. So as you would expect, the more B lines you can count, the worse the outcome for your patient is likely to be. Again, there are now a lot of studies and meta-analysis suggesting that if you want to train nurses or students, you can do it very easily, little level of training required. And after, let's say, less than 100 examination that they perform independently, they, they have a high sensitivity and specificity in identifying B lines and pleural effusion. Potentially, we can also look at the congestion in other organs uh, in the body, including the kidneys. And you can see, but I'm not going into details, you just see here that the continuous flow from the kidneys to bring the blood back to circulation into the veins should be continuous. If there is a problem into the pressure into the main system, the uh, vein uh, in the, the kidneys have to increase their pressure, which means that the flow into the veins there will be discontinuous. And again, discontinuous flow into the venous system of the kidney is a problem for the patient. Now, to do all of this before 2020, and I wouldn't say 2020 just because of COVID. I think COVID has been a, a push to the use of modern technologies and for different reasons. Before 2020, to do all these tests, we needed a mobile echo machine. And when I say it's mobile, I mean, this is already huge, even if it's mobile. So you can imagine if you're not a clinician, how 
big and no mobile machine can be. And we needed three probes, one for the jugular vein, one for the kidneys, and one for the heart and lungs. Each probe has a cost that may vary between six to 10K. A machine might go 50 to 100K. So it's quite expensive and indeed moving this huge equipment across words is not really, really practical. And it may increase the risk of damaging the machine and though then not able to examine other people. But after COVID with a lot of, uh, probably not in the UK, but certainly in Italy, Spain, uh, South America, where GPs particularly did not have access to blood tests. They started to look at the lungs of patients presenting to their clinic because with B lines, for instance, you could identify, or you could differentiate between a, a COVID pneumonia from, for instance, uh, uh, fluids due to heart failure. And there has been an expansion in these systems of these equipments that you can see here, you can connect to an iPad, to an iPhone, and either they can communicate with a mobile system just by Wi-Fi. They are highly affordable. The price range from 6 day to less than 2K for this device, for instance. They are light, portable. They provide a high quality image. Many of these are already powered by artificial intelligence, as you will see later, and are very easy to use solutions that are likely to change the medical imaging in every setting and specialty. So it's going to happen, particularly if you look at what these uh, tools can do. So for instance, this device is made of a single silicon chip and one probe that again costs less than 2000 can emulate all the three transducers that we have seen before at a cost at one-tenth of the tree. It also is useful because these tools provide the opportunity to do a remote teleguidance. You can see, for instance, a person scanning in any environment, a patient, and then if not practical, can interact with someone here who is guiding, uh, again, the uh, sonographer, how to move the probe and how to adjust the image for a better diagnosis. And this is something that we are using even here in Glasgow to train uh, one of our colleagues, well, our colleagues down in Malawi, for instance, to uh, acquire images of uh, in uh, people with uh, cardiovascular risk factors to look at the extent of uh, cardiac dysfunction in this population. Artificial intelligence is also something that has produced, again, uh, a push in the widespread use of this technology because now due to the wide availability of uh, anonymized uh, echocardiographic uh, images, artificial intelligence has been already shown to be feasible to interpret and to reproduce uh, results of the um, measurements and to provide also not only diagnostic but also very strong pronostic information and i just show you a few examples of what's already available out there so there are for instance softwares that are able to just by pressing a button using images from diff well, different images by looking at the heart from different uh, places, they can measure the ejection fraction and provide uh, a percentage of the likelihood of a normal scan in this case, or can also assist the physicians to acquire better images and explain how to move the probe, where to move the probe, and then once the image is acquired to a very satisfactory level, they can auto calculate the ejection fraction and giving you the right number to do your uh, clinical interpretation and whatever you need to do. So when I say that the ultrasound will replace this, um, the stethoscope, I mean, many people say, ah, oh, that's not going to happen. But actually I think that in five years time, this is what the, a doctor may look like. So we will have a probe around the neck and rather than a stethoscope. So just to conclude, I really think that ultrasound allows to evaluate cardiac dysfunction and its consequences, particularly congestion in real time, safely because there is no radiation risk to the patient, comprehensively in different organs and, so, and importantly, objectively. So we can quantify the problem and the problem, we can tell a number to the people who are coming next to follow up or to whom we are handing over the problem. 
affordable handheld ultrasound is transforming healthcare as a diagnostic tool. And there is a potential to be equip ubiquitous or actually to replace the stethoscope. And whether these novel technologies can be used to improve the management of patients with or at risk heart failure should be really explored. So that's from me. Okay, so any questions to Pier Paolo? We should always remember that certainly in a, a health service like the NHS, that the, by far the most expensive item are the people who work in the NHS. And if we can provide them with uh, the best equipment to make the best use of their time for managing patients, then that's usually a good investment. So, but uh, any other points? Do you, question on my end, do the remote or the butterfly echoes, do they require, what kind of infrastructure do they require to run? So is it, why do they run over Wi-Fi or is it completely, is the processing done completely on the phone or do you upload to a service? To... But, so, I mean, either you have Wi-Fi, you, you need an internet connection, whether if you connect through your iPhone, either it can be a, knife, a Wi-Fi or your, I don't know, the signal of your, I don't know, three mobile, whatever network you got. Mm. But obviously in Africa, it may be a bit more difficult. So we rely on a Wi-Fi signal down there. But this, I mean, it, it, it happens in real time. So it happens as we talk. So if I talk, for instance, you are the sonographer, I would see what you are scanning on my screen. There are multiple uh, windows and I can just tell you, oh, move a bit down, move up. And otherwise I can move with my mouse. Mm -hmm. I can show you what you need to do. And then you can just follow the arrows on your screen. Oh, I'll try to do this. I'll try to do that. Incline the probe or put it down. It's very efficient. I mean, it's just incredible. I was playing, let's say in early phase with uh, Alison Price. She is not a cardiologist. She is not, she was able to scan the you know, the partner, in a sense, to take a picture of the heart of someone else. So it's just amazing what you can do with these tools. And yep. we explore the full potential yet. It really is a revolution. And, um, and in terms of uh, African and other uh, populations, it really is uh, um, potentially trans transformational. We just had a visit from our colleagues in Mozambique yesterday. I think they're going to be very interested as well. So. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have a question. Yep, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, what is like the quality of these uh, the images captured by these mobile, very small mobile devices compared with more conventional machines, and how good are these AI algorithms like at reading the measurements, such as the ejection fraction? I think they are pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, if I mean, when I started to do ultrasound, I was, was probably, I don't know, maybe 2000 something. I mean, we had some machines where you really struggle. I mean, now the new machines have a very high quality, but compared to what I used to have, if I look at the image of the quality of the image that I can have on my iPhone is just amazing, even if the technology of the probe is completely different. So it's not a crystal pezzolatic, but it's just a microchip. It works incredibly well. And when you press the button, I mean, if you expect 55%, the artificial intelligence comes with 55%. You say, wow, that's just amazing. And I think they are working not just on the ejection fraction side, but there are a uh, lot of companies who are measuring Again, it depends from whom who they are driven. So there are some who are concentrating on speckle tracking, but there are some who are concentrating on left atrial volume or and the amount of B lines that they can quantify or the amount of pleural effusion. So I think we are going to see a huge development in the next couple of years, and it's just amazing. Yeah. Okay, uh, we must go on because I have a hard stop at two. So. Um... Uh, hopefully we can get my oh. Oh. yeah get the right button um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, redefining what heart failure is um, 
Uh, you've seen this before, which is the what I call the new old universal definition of heart failure. It's a bit more colourful, uh, but it does depend still on symptoms and signs. The problem with them is that they're a late manifestation of heart failure. They have a low specificity and they're often not recognised until uh, things are severe. If you think about it, everybody gets breathless on exertion. And as people get older, um, an awful lot of people attribute their breathlessness to just getting older. Um, if you're going to wait for symptoms like orthopnea and breathlessness at rest, then you've waited too long. Uh, and peripheral edema is, of course, common. Uh, anybody who's done a long distance flight will know that. So symptoms and signs are pretty unreliable. Uh, and of course, communicating with our patients uh, often has uh, um, as many failures as uh, communicating by Wi-Fi. Um, and our patients may tell us that they're not breathless, but if they're just watching television all day, that's the reason why they're not breathless. Uh, and patients, of course, learn to avoid symptoms by changing their behaviours. If we actually look at this analysis of uh, CPRD, uh, published a, a few years back, you can see that uh, the first diagnosis of heart failure was during a hospital admission in 79% of, of cases. Uh, many of these patients had been to see their GP who had recorded symptoms that could be interpreted as heart failure, but no action was taken until the patient was sick enough uh, to require hospitalization. And that's bad news because uh, by the time you're sick enough to be hospitalised uh, in the UK, your um, uh, one-year mortality is about 31%. Uh, it's not that the NHS is so bad, uh, it is because the, the patients are really quite sick. Uh, and if you look at the US uh, VA, which has published similar data, albeit in a much younger population, it's about a 20% six percent mortality at one year uh, and the issue is how complacent uh, should we be um, you know do you wait for people to go blind uh, do you wait for people to have symptoms of anemia before you're going to do something about it uh, and why do we wait that long for heart failure and heart failure of course uh, many people say is complex and that's true if you're looking uh, for the uh, causes of heart failure, but it has this final common pathway. Uh, it's a cardiorenal syndrome. It's a syndrome characterized by cardiac dysfunction and water and salt retention, with an emphasis on water rather than salt. If we think about the normal physiology, uh, you go out for an Indian meal, which is uh, full of salts, and uh, you, of course, uh, get thirsty and you take water to dilute the salt. Uh, that water will then stimulate the rise in BNP, natriuretic peptides, which are designed as the natural's, uh, body's natural defense against congestion. You'll then increase water and salt excretion and you'll normalize your BNP. But if you've got heart failure or congestion, okay, you get your rise in BNP, but there is a failure uh, for that to stimulate uh, water and salt excretion. So there's a kidney uh, failure in a sense, uh, and therefore you'll get a persistent rise in BNP and that persistent uh, increase in circulating volume will lead to atrial dilation and we can call that heart failure but we don't need to have symptoms in order to call it heart failure. Looking at one side of the coin, if you do have a diagnosis of heart failure and you've got a relatively normal uh, natriuretic peptide, you have an excellent prognosis as uh, Pier Paolo has shown us in this particular article. On the other hand, if you have uh, this is a the DECLARE study on type 2 diabetes. Most of the patients in the study, uh, this is a randomized trial of dapagliflozin, I should say. Most of the patients in the study heart failure. But notice that there are more patients without a diagnosis of heart failure with an elevated NT pro BNP uh, in the study than there are uh, patients with heart failure 
regardless of the BNP. Notice again that if you've got a diagnosis of heart failure, but your BNP is pretty normal, you have a, a quite a good outcome. On the other hand, if nobody has bothered to diagnose your heart failure, but you have an elevated natriuretic peptide, then you have outcomes that look awfully like heart failure. And this is another one of Pierre Paolo's papers, this time looking at another SGLT2 inhibitor study, the EMPA-REG study, showing that on the right-hand side, uh, if you were taking uh, diuretics, it really didn't matter whether you had a heart failure or not. Very similar to uh, um, Jocelyn's data, uh, thing, mortality associates with the use of diuretic rather than with the diagnosis of heart failure. And notice again in the EMPA-REG that it's striking that the uh, reductions in uh, mortality uh, are driven by uh, benefits in the patients taking diuretics. It didn't really matter much whether you had heart failure or not, it didn't matter very much whether you weren't taking, didn't have heart failure or take di diuretics. The big benefit for the SGLT2 inhibitors were the diuretic treated patients. And that's diuretics and BNP are just two signals that uh, the patient is more likely to have congestion. If we look at the altitude trial of uh, type 2 diabetes, this time with uh, uh, a renin inhibitor, you can see you can throw away all of the, your prognostic information other than the BNP. One simple blood test uh, tells you as much as a, a multivariable model with 20 other variables. So just use natriuretic peptides to identify risk. I think the risk that these patients are carrying is of heart failure. And if you think about what is heart failure, uh, is this problem of cardiac dysfunction leading to congestion. If you have a healthy heart, then you need a big slug of something bad to precipitate heart failure. You need a major myocardial infarction. On the other hand, if your heart has been uh, getting sick uh, through hypertension and other reasons uh, over decades, then a very small event, uh, perhaps a chest infection or something like that, will be enough uh, to precipitate congestion on the onset of heart failure. But why wait until you only need a small precipitant to uh, cause heart failure? Uh, why not manage the patient earlier? So we're proposing a different definition of heart failure, which gets rid of symptoms and signs, and just focuses on cardiac dysfunction with evidence of congestion. And the two markers you, uh, I think, that are simplest to go for, and Pier Paolo may want to add more, but if we're saying that we want a belt and braces approach, then a raised natriuretic peptide and a dilated left atrium, because it doesn't really matter what's wrong with your, the left side of your heart, at least. Uh, if something serious is going wrong, uh, your left atrium will dilate. So just to summarize, uh, I think Jocelyn has shown us that loop diuretic prescription should alert the clinician to the possibility of heart failure. I think many of these patients do indeed have heart failure, but uh, Pierre Paolo is uh, working on that and doing the acid test, which is to take those patients and withdraw the loop diuretic and actually see whether the patient develops uh, symptoms and signs whether the diuretics are masking the problem. And of course, we have many other red flags, uh, diabetes, long-standing hypertension, atrial fibrillation, coronary disease, chronic kidney disease, chronic respiratory disease, maybe just age itself, and loop diuretics, inhalers, and use of more than two antihypertensive agents, I think could all be red flags for this problem of heart failure. And if you don't develop heart failure, you're going to die of something else other than cardiovascular disease, I think. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, happy to take any questions. Um, so uh, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, it, it is a problem with these uh, cross cutting themes in uh, IHW is that uh, I was on the HETA one last week. I was the only person not from HETA uh, on the uh, 
on these lunchtime meetings. So uh, we have lots of opportunities of speaking to us internally, but um, and it's nice to uh, engage with colleagues elsewhere in the university. But uh, yeah, we do need to uh, do something to uh, stimulate uh, the crosstalk. Otherwise, yeah, we would do different talks. <laughs> Okay. I think probably the fact that it's only circulated around the institute, but you maybe want it circulated wider. Yeah. Okay. We can take that back uh, to the uh, and say that uh, yeah, it would be good. You know, maybe to get engineering and uh, yeah, or maybe it also and... maybe also a bit earlier because mm -hmm. this yeah. notification only came out a couple of days ago. Yeah. Uh, well, the, I think they're supposed to be announced at the beginning of the year, the program at least, and then the, the reminders come out. But, yeah, but yeah. the programs are usually full of to be, to be decided, to be decided. Oh well, we decided this one last November, I think. So yeah. So it's not us. <laughs> no, I know. I know. Yeah. Okay. So I have. Oh. You have, you have one question. Oh. Right, I have a question. Yeah, Neve. I was I was only going to say, well, thanks to all of you because that was really interesting and as a primary care clinician, really useful. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if because I actually do my clinical work in Edinburgh. I don't know if you know it if it varies across Scotland and um, the kind of different pathways because we have access to testing NT Pro BNP um, as part of our referral for suspected heart failure, um, which is the, the normal pathway that we use that's been there for a few years so again that's partly why that what you've described as the clinical kind of pathways was surprising to me although it just struck me in the last presentation that part of what we have when we refer patients is a question of have they responded to a loop, have their symptoms responded to a loop diuretic so some a sort of assumption that you will do some empirical that you'll try that in the first instance so are you suggesting that kind of cardiologists are going to come and stop that and test patients or? Well, I think that we need to find out a little bit more about this very large population, which mm -hmm. nobody seems to want to do anything about, which is incredible. You know, if you found a new disease uh, which hadn't been recognized before and was killing, um, you know, uh, a major cause of death in, uh, mm -hmm. in Scotland, uh, you'd think that somebody would... Uh, be want yeah. to find out a bit more about that you know is this just a marker of heart failure and congestion i suspect it is to some extent um is the are the diuretics actually driving the outcome i mean are they the disease mm. uh, and so and that would be terrifying if yeah. uh, you know we're actually killing people by giving them uh, uh mm -hmm. a drug that we've never that, you know we don't have a morbidity mortality trial of uh, loop diuretics <laughs> be difficult to design but um well, we're having thoughts mm -hmm. um uh, but it, you know it's possible that uh, that the loop diuretics are the cause of the problem and not yeah. just uh, the red flag the marker mm -hmm. um and yeah, so we, we need to investigate more. Yeah. I don't think we're making any clinical recommendations at the moment, other than the fact that if you're on a loop diuretic, maybe somebody ought to investigate why yeah. you're on it and so yeah. on. So um, so it's a pity you're working over in Edinburgh, otherwise you could uh, work yeah. with Pier, Pier Paolo and he would, uh, yeah. he, he would give you a good, uh, I mean, I imagine we have the same picture over here. I, 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 yeah. you know, I wasn't aware of it to look for it, but it, there's a lot to learn for clinicians anywhere, anywhere. Yeah, well, we, we've looked at this in CPRD and uh, it's pretty well the same picture mm -hmm. uh, in CPRD. So you can see that this is also happening in England and uh, uh, we're hopefully we'll get an opportunity to look at the Welsh data as well. So we, we think that this is, uh, and we've got Impareg as well, and we've been looking at some big atrial fibrillation studies. It's the same problem there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the loop diuretics consistently give a stronger signal of um, harm than mm -hmm. a diagnosis of heart failure. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Okay, I've got to go now. So thank you very much. And I'll speak to most of you later today. <laughs>
Bye Thank for you. now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining.